This is the Dane Moore MBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks coming at you Thursday morning. It's October 17th. Uh, and coming up on today's show, I have Britt Robson here with me. Julius Randall debuted last night. Uh, we have to get into that. His his preseason debut against the Bulls. A few other notes from that game, maybe not specific to Randall. We'll hit on though. I think we're we're starting to hit on the same things. Like, yeah, Josh Mina, <laughs> he's back <laughs> again. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo, I don't know. We'll try and not totally retread over conversations Britt and I uh, have have already had. But uh, Britt also wrote a column. Um, there was one part of the column about like Rudy Gobert in the offense that made me be like, oh, wait, no, nope. oh, oh yeah, I guess that's actually true. Uh, so I want to talk. I want to talk about uh, talk with Britt about his Gobert part of his. I don't know if it's your season preview column, but uh, preseason. Uh, so we'll get into that on the show today. But before that, I want to kind of let you know the upcoming schedule. Just, I guess, just at least for the end of this week, this weekend, Thursday, today, uh, the Wolves actually play a game uh, against the Nuggets at Target Center. Um, so I'll be there. And then on Friday, Kyle and I will do our bold predictions episode that we kind of do at this time every year. If something interesting happens in uh, tonight's Wolves game, uh, we'll talk about that too. But I think we might see a lot of uh, Wolves players resting in this one because it's back to back. So that's Friday, and then Saturday is Wolves Fest at uh, Poly Knife Brewing Company in Northeast. I'll give you more details about that later in the episode. But just right off the top, I wanted to, uh, yeah, just remind you of that. I guess Wolves Fest this Saturday, October nineteenth, three to seven p.m. Britt and I are doing a live pod at at five p.m. Uh, would love to. To see a lot of you there um, and and chat uh, some wolves over a beer, but Britt, let's uh, let's start with Randall uh, okay. from last night. This was our first. This was our first time seeing him uh, in a wolves jersey. We had you know questions about how it's going to look, how sticky it is, where's the ball movement, all those sort of things. Um, we're obviously not coming to any conclusions off of a preseason game, no. but uh, I, I'm actually just curious, kind of where where you're at with what that looked like last night. I'm a little surprised at how far along he was given that he hasn't played competitive basketball for quite a while, but obviously I think he's been working out pretty steadily. I mean, you could tell that uh, he is not uncomfortable on the court right now at all. Physically, he looks very close to hundred percent if he's not already. And he did a lot of Julius Randall things. Um, my reservations about Randall remain. And uh, one of the reasons they remain is because he was, I thought almost close to prime form. I mean, he did, like when I say Julius Randall things, he, he played bully ball. Uh, he saw a seam in the defense and, uh, you know, dribbled in for a slam uh, he kind of got a little sticky sometimes, overly deferred other times. That in relationship between him and Ant, you could tell both of them want it to work for the other. Both of them know that they're both ball dominant. But what I keep coming back to, and this has only been made more poignant by how beautiful the movement and ball movement has been without Randall and sometimes Rudy and some other players off the court um, is that it isn't going to be a seamless fit. Um, Not only that, but the defense wasn't there. And some of that was the bulls hitting from outside. I mean, bottom line, uh, Randall wasn't quite as minus as some of the other starters who played in the game were minus, but with the, quote unquote starting five on the court the wolves looked very clunky and they did not look like a team that was sharing the ball a lot and they did not look like a team that um had a flow going to them um there were some individuals mcdaniels and rudy had a flow um and i don't think there was a lack of effort i just think that um i just you know and maybe you know obviously the obvious answer to that is it's going to take some time. Well, but that's what I'm thinking is it's like, I, I think listening to you and, and looking at my like kind of discombobulated notes from last night on it, like, yeah, time. We don't know. 
We don't, neither of you or I know Julius Randle well enough. We don't know what he looks like in the context of this. We can go off of what we saw in the game last night, but I'm sitting here listening to you and I kind of saw different things. Like I saw Julius Randle to me looked like he wasn't in game shape yet. Totally understandable. Um, So I would kind of push back on the idea that he looks like ready, ready to go. Um, I think one of his main Julius Randle things is like a post up into like fadeaway leaner and and he's actually good at that that looked really bad last night he was he does not seem to have the touch on his shot within like a game context right now but the force was absolutely there i think some of the playmaking stuff was absolutely there and i think we saw some of the what randall looks like in you know it in that he triggers the ball movement. The movement starts once he starts it. He kind of bangs, bangs, and then he gets it, he gets it out and it gets moving. But I don't know. I don't think we we like we have a great idea of who he is, what he's gonna look like in this, and how this is all going to come together because this was the first basketball game he's played in a long time. And frankly, we just don't know Julius Randall that well. Well, we know, I mean, we've seen Julius Randall a lot. Uh, Julius Randle is a ball dominant guy. Fair. I mean, you know, uh, I don't understand why that would be something that would change necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, when you have Rudy and Ant and Julius Randle on the court with Mike Conley and Jade McDaniel, it is not going to be mm-hmm. the fun hoops we saw when two or three of them were off the court. Now, does that mean they're going to be better or worse? they most likely will be better once everything gets into the flow. Uh, I I do agree with, sorry, not to to cut you off, but I do agree with like, I feel like Randall's best five man pairing is not going to be the starting five. Absolutely. That that we understand for those reasons that, that you're laying out. I, I co-sign that for sure. And so I guess what I worry about is that um, first of all, it was very convenient and I don't mean that as like some kind of conspiracy or something that Nas wasn't in the rotation. Uh, uh, If he was, then it would be a a very different look. And so you have guys like DiVincenzo and Nas and Ant is a barometer here because he can go either way. He can be in the sticky half court offense and relatively thrive when a shot is on, which wasn't last night at all. Or he can be in a go-go offense with Nas and DDV and, you know, kind of the stuff we've seen in the first three games, which was pretty spectacular uh, and a lot of fun. And so on offense. uh, So, again, I remember two years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that I don't have biases that are affecting my opinion. I remember two years ago or three years ago, whatever it was, where I bemoan the lack of the fly around defense, even though the non fly around defense was at least as good and usually better. Mm-hmm. Um, it stop, can be stop. a matter. It can be a matter of aesthetics rather than performance. But I also think there is a danger when you have a couple of ball stoppers on the court. Um, even both of those guys are averaging over five assists a game, but they are the type of assists that they draw a double, get the assist, give it to the open man who makes the shot. That's fundamental basketball. But another fundamental basketball is the one Chris Finch likes and preaches, which is that the ball moves, people move without the ball, and you have a kind of momentum that is contagious among the team, contagious to the audience. And we have not seen that the last two years. And I worry that we won't see it this year either uh, the i like the way you put it in the the comparison to the defense i i've made that comp some too i don't remember if it's has been with you or with somebody else but just the idea that we certainly liked watching the wolves play defense in a more aggressive coverage a couple years back flying around as you said um though it as again as you said it wasn't necessarily better than when they played right. offense more cons- or defense sorry more conservative conservatively and drop coverage with Rudy and just kind of all that comes out of that more conservative coverage. I do think that's the comp in this like ball movement and the flow is, is offensive fly around and, and more 
isolation centric um offense is is a little bit more right conservative basic right. to the point uh and also i think if your isolation players or the guys that you're really directing action to like ant and randall are good at that it can be more effective than right. flow like what why teams in basketball go to like a ball and body movement type of offense is when they can't beat their guy one-on-one -on -one. You know, or that is going to be a, a more difficult thing to do. Or that now. they're OKC. Sure. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think of I think of OKC as as an isolation team that finds better isolation matches through ball movement. Like they're they're a good and transition and pace. Yeah, I sure. mean, uh, and turnovers and fly around on defense. I mean, and I'm the just... pace is the part that the Wolves yeah. with Randall and Ant together that's still very to be determined and again i mean shitting on john ran uh, julius randall <laughs> after after no 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 just uh, said julius <laughs> having that uh right away is not something that i think is appropriate which is why i gave you all kinds of caveats but i cannot help watching that guy and knowing the reason I said he was kind of in game shape or ready because I've seen this exact thing yeah. with LA with the Knicks. I quite frankly can't remember him in New Orleans that much. Was he only one year there? Yeah, and it was the okay. year that Anthony Davis requested the trade. Okay. And I, knowing yeah. you, I think you would have been like, you know, I'm yeah, not watching. That I mean, I, I what I remember, I remember him in LA very well, and I remember him in New York very well. Mm -hmm. And he he was a very similar type player. Sure. Uh, the, the other thing that worries me is he does not have self-awareness about when it's time to stop trying to shoot. And unfortunately, that was exactly what Ann had last night. Uh, and not that, again, it's contagious. Ann is perfectly capable of doing that on his own. It just, I worry about the, the critical mass of that type of thing. We worried about Cat and Ant on the floor because both of them like to stand and survey a lot and then turn the ball over by dribbling in the traffic. Um, I don't think, I think that in that respect, simply in that respect, Randall is a slight improvement over Cat. He is not a slight improvement in terms of his range and spacing, mm -hmm. uh, but he can, he can get a bucket in the paint better than Cat, even though Cat had a really nice jump hook and really nice off the bounce. But at the end of the day, Julius Randle's career E field goal percentage is 50.9. For somebody mm -hmm. that big who yep. shoots that often, uh, you know, we already have one of those guys, one of those volume shooting low efficiency sure. guys, you know. And again, none of this is news. I mean, if it was, the deal would have been tat cat for Randle straight up. You know, right, right. I mean, and and so and Randall, even if he opts in next year, is twenty million dollars cheaper than Cat. I get it all. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not ripping. No, you're talking the about the basketball from... that's about to happen in yes exactly. five days. What's that going to look like? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's not and a so, referendum on the trip. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I'd be happy to be proven wrong. You know, it wouldn't be the first time. And so, let's Can I make, see. Let me let me make the case. Let me okay. make the case because. And again, this isn't this isn't based out of me being blown away by Julius Randle sure. last night. It's what I think Julius Randle will do. Um, one thing he will do that will make up for some of the gap in his shooting efficiency is if and when he is doubled, I think he will get off of it quicker and more effectively than Cat did. Um, Cat struggled with doubles. We all know that that's been mm -hmm. a story of the the last three seasons. I was encouraged by seeing some of that from Randall last night. Okay, doubles here, bam, out, move, 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 balls in the corner in two seconds. Like the surrounding personnel, I think, knows how to play that way. The question I have is how often are teams going to give Randall that type of attention? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like one and a half bodies, right? Right. So that it is an advantage. And then if they don't, if they guard him straight up, as even happened with Cap many times last year, who, again, better offensive player than, than Julius Randall. Is he just going to, if it is just a one-on-one -on -one matchup and they're like, all right, like, go ahead. We're going to let you shoot 25 of these. Um, you know, is he going to be able to be 
effective and efficient enough on volume in those situations when teams dare him to. And if he isn't, who's going to step in and, and what's, and, and, you know, and what's going to, what's going to happen from a Finch standpoint, from a, and, you know, you don't, you don't want in that situation where it's like, okay, Randall's got a good matchup here, but all of a sudden, you know, we're at the beginning of the third quarter and Randall has 14 shots and Ant has six, you know, right, right. Um, I, I, I have, I have those concerns, but if Randall can present himself as a weapon that you can't afford to guard one-on-one in, in situations, then, then that's where this builds off of it. That's when you start stacking off of it. They got to play there. And now we're, now we're swinging in the corner. Jaden's again, like I said, got open three right, there. Right. Rudy's diving down the lane and there, there's some chemistry there. And then obviously Ant is, is playing against a shifted defense. I think Randall could be better at that part of it. I just don't know if he's going to get the attention to trigger that. If that makes sense. Well, I, I, that's a great scenario. And, and it, it gives me a lot to work with here because one of the things that I believe about Randall is he runs really hot and cold. And, nice. and I really see there are times when bring one, bring two, you know, he's getting 30. Uh, he got 57 against this team yeah. uh, you know, defense, two, right. two years ago. Yeah. Wasn't that last year? I, I, was it last year? I think it might have been two years ago, but it might have been last year. I thought it was oh, yeah. 57 two years ago. I mean, he got a lot. One we of the games that. they played last year. Anyway. Sorry, I should know that. But. That's right. And so the point being, there are games where Randall should be given free reign. But in the past, one of his problems has been that he doesn't know when he's not not going to have one of those nights. And Finch needs either a quick hook or he needs to have the awareness. And maybe he will. I mean, you know, I'm, I don't want to, you know, say that it won't happen. I was interested to see that uh, even though they looked like they kind of crimped each other's style, Brunson particularly crimping Randall's style when Brunson emerged as the obvious go-to guy, their net rating in two-player lineups uh, were very, very, wasn't bad. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't injurious. And so there is hope for everything you're talking about. There's hope for the idea that if they have to single him because you've got and other weapons on the floor, that he punishes those matchups. And when they go to the double, he'll have enough self-awareness and coaching to right. get off it and make this offense improve. Um, that is clearly a possibility. And if that happens, um, then, you know, then my concerns are strictly aesthetic and therefore moot because you, you don't win games by looking pretty. You win games by scoring more points to your opponent. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, uh, it wasn't last season. It's two years ago, 57 points um, that, that he had uh, against the Wolves. So it wasn't against the Wolves. Number one defense was whatever, what, like 10th, two years ago, um, something like that. I think we can keep talking about Randall within the context of that Gobert yes. uh, conversation, which is just more, more talking about the offense. Uh, but first, let's let people know that uh, we are going to be at Falling Knife on, on Saturday. And, you know, it'll be the last episode that we do of the pod before the, the season starts. Um, obviously, I will put together something to talk about at the, the beginning there. I still need to do that. But we'd like to take a bunch of uh, questions from uh, those of you who are there. We'll have an extra microphone uh, for you guys to ask us questions, maybe stuff that we've been uh, missing uh, this, you know, during uh, the pods we've done this, uh, yeah, this preseason and, and, or just a uh, different idea, different things you'd yeah like us to, to talk about. So come ask questions, hang out. It's, uh, it's kind of like a full wolves themed brewery day, three to 7 PM uh, at falling knife brewing company in, in Northeast Minneapolis. And, uh, the, the plan is we'll kind of, we'll be getting there, uh, around three and then the live show will be kind of 5 PM to we'll go about an hour with those uh typically so i would love to see you at three good time if you want to come say hi uh before and have a beer ask Britt or i a, a question say hello whatever um if you want to do that come come earlier uh but we'll we'll hang out before um we'll do the pod and and we'll hang out uh after that as well looks like it's going to be good weather too 
Yes, I, just, I was getting a little in the 70s. Like, yeah, Monday morning when I like pulled up my phone, I was like, it's 37 <laughs> degrees outside today. Shoot. Yeah. Uh, they also have uh, they, they've printed these beers. They got my nerdy little salary cap sheets on them as uh, as the, the label. It's their second apron beer that they're uh, releasing for, for this event as well. So, yeah, would love to see y'all uh, at Falling Knife this uh, this Saturday. Northeast Minneapolis, 3 to 7 p.m. And go there to watch the. Go there to watch the the, the Lynx game on, on Friday night as well. Um, I think that's all I have on that. Uh, my the, our other uh, sponsor today is Prize Picks, and uh, we have Thursday night football uh, this evening. If you'd like to put together a Prize Picks lineup, uh, you can do so at PrizePicks.com or on the Prize Picks app. Uh, if you submit a five dollar lineup you get a uh, $50 immediately uh, credited into, into your account here. I see these numbers are jumping around on me. Oh, my numbers fell. Uh, the two, two that I like uh, for tonight are Bo Nix, less than 25 and a half rushing yards, and Al Alvin Kamara, less than 106 and a half total rushing plus receiving yards. Uh, again, if you just do uh, $5 on, on that, they both come to fruition. You win 15 there, and if it's your first time playing, you will be credited $50 into your account. That's prizepicks.com, prize picks app. Uh, Kyle and I are going to do an NBA themed prize picks season long uh, yeah, segment tomorrow. So there's there's a lot for you to check out on that app as well at prize picks. Uh, all right, Britt, let's uh let's keep going. I mean, I I, I don't want to give the Julius Randall piece short shrift, but I think this kind of well, we have limited knowledge. I mean, we do. That's true. Yeah. And, and and I thought the sample size was actually more than I, I he played more than I thought he would put it that yeah, way. Yeah, he played and, he played eleven minutes in the first quarter. The first, yeah. old, you know, I right. was like, wow, okay. So it, clearly, he was ready. I mean, when we were in Iowa, one of the the only interaction I had in that lo Iowa locker room was just basically <laughs> talking to him for like three minutes, just you know, mm -hmm. or two minutes, and uh, you know. He, when I said, are you going to play against the Knicks? He said, I wish, you know, and, and then it, it turned out to be this. I, I don't think he'll play tonight, but uh, I think Rudy might, you know, leading into the Rudy thing, just simply because if you're just going to throw a sore shouldered Nas and a, uh, you know, and, and Mr. Iowa against, uh, you know, the MVP, uh, that it, it provided that Jokic plays, mm -hmm. uh, that would be that would be unfortunate for the only appearance of the team before the home crowd. Uh, so, so what what you wrote about um, in your one of your preseason pieces, yeah, was which I don't know why I had really put this together, but we've all been raving about the ball movement. Finch has been talking about how important that is, and the you know. And I think in many ways, part of the reason behind the trade, right? right. Um, we want to move the ball more. And it's looked great. We've heard we, it's looked great in what we've seen in preseason. Um, it sounded like it's really sort of been sinking into the team. We're like, woo, the offense is going to be great. <laughs> Not going to be below average again this year. And what you pointed out, you're like, yes, true. I've loved what this has looked like. But I don't know what the number was exactly. You're like, but Rudy Gobert has played like 27 minutes all. Yeah, right. all, he played, all he's played all 38 first. minutes. And part of it was, you know, he only bows in two of the three games. Yeah. But it, it when when the, the team clicked in terms of that beautiful aesthetic we talked about, uh, you know, again, it isn't necessarily Rudy. So I I get what I, I, I think your your point is, is that Rudy isn't a normal typical fit into his skill set isn't a typical fit into a flow based offense when we think about you know aesthetically pleasing quick decision making swinging the ball ability to shoot um but different places at different times but i've always kind of thought of rudy as the engine of mm. the flow in that like that like he's like the pistons right that like are kind uh -huh. of like firing and down the middle down the middle of the floor, there's constantly this Rudy rolling through or cutting through, moving from the top of the key, whether it be in a pick and roll down to right. the rim uh, as a as a roller or just kind of flowing from the top of the key down into dunker spot into dunker spot. And I think that kind of has a piston 
like um right power to sure. to the to the offense and and it it does in ways invigorate the movement surrounding him mm. in 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 the lane though you're right to say that doesn't work all the time <laughs> that, that right. isn't that isn't accurately what happens in in you know like a a great frequency and i do think though when he's not out there and you don't have that rim presence that it does end up just kind of being perimeter based ball movement maybe with drive and kick replacing some of that rim and lane pressure and maybe they just have more players who who, who can do that now and they can make that work but i I'm not saying I, I disagree with it, but that's where my head went. If that makes I, sense, I, I disagree on two two levels there. Well, One is uh, the word invigorate. I do not think he invigorates the offense uh, that way. Do you not uh, think when he dives to the basket and two bodies have to go when two bodies go to him, mm -hmm. that doesn't no invigorates not necessarily. Strong of a term. I mean, if, if let's put it this way: if there was immediate passes to uh, exploit that, uh, maybe. Um, and fair the fair other fair fair. is that uh, you're forgetting cutting. Um, there is so much more cutting and so much more transition pace. People have their head up. When Rudy is in the game, even though, as Finch correctly pointed out in the interview I did with him uh, before training camp, he's often the guy running the floor as well as anybody. Mm -hmm. But there is just the fact that when Rudy is not in the game, the players play freer. They just do. 100% agree. And, and that freedom creates its own thing. And that, ironically, is exactly what Finch knows and philosophizes. That you basically, everybody gets on their horse, figures out where people are on the fly, and shares the ball and moves without the ball. It isn't that... Rudy Gobert is one of the greatest defenders in NBA history and also really does the few things he does well on offense so well that he is not a detriment on offense by himself. But it's kind of like Randall. It is a style you get locked into if you play him. And as I said in the piece, on net, you're not going to say, well, Rudy Gobert should be benched. I mean, obviously, you you take your lumps in that offensive flow or lack thereof because your defense is so good and because you can still do the lobs. You can still do the high screens and rolls. And you can still do some of the other things. Uh, I was really pleased to see that another thing Finch mentioned to me in that conversation was he wants to see more McDaniel, Rudy pick and rolls. They were fabulous in the first quarter. That was nice. Yeah, They were great. I mean, McDaniel's four of his five assists last night, I think, were to Rudy, or maybe three of the five. But it was really – so many people are trying to work with Rudy. Nas has been trying. Ann has been trying. They don't do it well. I mean, you know, that Nas uh, Euro step into the lob for Rudy in game one being a great exception. But for the most part – Rudy doesn't have the hands for quick decisions, uh, and he does not uh, handle the ball well without some forewarning. It just is the way he is most of the time. Um, now, the team has surrounded itself. It's got Joe Ingles. It's got Mike Conley. They drafted Dillingham specifically to have that lob threat sometimes, not only for transition, but for Rudy. And so they, they're they not going to, you know, they're not going to go away from Rudy Gobert. The Rudy Gobert experience is only going to be um, relentlessly continuing because that is their ticket to what they want to do, which is win it all. And that is what happens when you have a great defense. That's your that, that elevates your chances more than anything. And that's what happened last year. That's why things will go really well this year. But we need to – I don't know the answer to this, but I do know 
that we are operating on two tracks with this team. We are operating with players who do really, really well in exactly the kind of hit and flow and read position and do it again and also run 94 feet with it uh, with great handles, with their head on a swivel. There's a lot of talent now on this team for a go-go flow offense. There is also a lot of talent on this team for a basic half court bread and butter, draw the double, kick it to the open man. If the, if the uh, defense shifts hard in time, feed it down low to the open man. I mean, it's basic. There are two ways to play that type of basketball. The Wolves have a one-on-one half court offense that is strong and they have the talent to do a really good flow offense, but they have not met expectations relative to the talent level for two years in a row now. And I don't know how they resolve that with this bifurcated personnel. It reminds me of uh, Draymond Green in Golden State a little bit, like back in the day mm -hmm. um, when they were the best offense of, of all time. And Draymond Green was one of the best defensive players in the league. Actually, a, a pretty good approximation of Rudy in his in his own way. And they made Draymond Green work on the offensive side of the floor because he so well fit into their free-flowing, split-action type yep. of offense. He stayed up at the high post in transition and looked around and either hit the guy on the three or hit the baseline cutter, which they did all the time. And then where he would get in trouble or where Golden State would get in trouble, <laughs> and it's part of the reason why they were and have always been a, a low-volume pick-and-roll team is when he was in a spread pick-and-roll you know, offense right. and would be – in trouble in the situations where he would need to be used as a spacer in the spread part of, right. of the pick and roll. And I think it's a, it's an interesting thing to compare against Rudy because Rudy is now, and for these last two seasons has been in an offense that is more flow and, and golden state ball movement and body movement style when his best offense in his career to date yes. yep. has been in a spread pick and roll alignment in Utah and the structure that that came with that. So I think you could argue that it'd be a bad idea to have Draymond green in a spread pick and roll within an offense that's predominant offensive force was spread pick and roll. And you can make the argument as, as you did. And I think it's right that a flow based offense is not, is not the best one for Rudy. I think that's why the Wolves are constantly searching for some of that meshing and being able to mesh a flow-based offense with a pick and roll that has a pick and roll element to it. And to be fair, I think I've seen some like growth between him and Ant that make me be like, oh yeah, that could maybe be that could maybe be a thing. But it's typically one of your your offense is typically one or the other, and and it's and it's it's hard to be both flow and a, a spread pick and roll team. And I think if this ultimately doesn't work and, you know, three, four years from now, we're looking back and we go, why did, why did the Wolves offense never really quite work with Rudy in the Finch early ant era? We'd be like, well, because I think we tried to, we, we took him out of a spread pick and roll, a primary spread pick and roll look, which is what they did go. I mean, they became much more of a spread pick and roll team the as the season went on and, you know, and yeah, and into the playoffs last season. But every indication and everything we like about what we've seen thus far is in ways a departure um, from some of that structured uh, spread pick and roll look. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I just think that's all that's all the information uh, on the topic. And I, what is what I keep coming back to. Is that we anybody who knows Rudy Gobert knows that he likes systems, he likes predictability, he likes continuity. This is a guy who comes to work, comes to play every day the same way, practically. Yep. There's very little deviation in who he is and what he does. 
And the fact that he's been able to flex his game, it doesn't look huge, but for him, it is huge. I mean, he he had an offense built around him by Quinn Snyder in Utah, and it worked pretty well. I mean, one year, I think they may have even been close to the top offense in the oh, NBA, if, if not were. the yeah. top offense in the NBA. The. And so – the fact that he has been told to be more in the dunker spot and to understand that he shouldn't always be going out to screen and rescreen and roll and re-roll, that sometimes he's just going to have to kind of get out of the way, go to the weak side if possible, you know, do something that doesn't uh, impact the game as much as he himself would like to impact the game. That's a big ask for a veteran, you know, who's now 11 years in the league. He's getting and, better at that, though, right? We would both agree he's getting better a, at that. And, and, and that's why I have a lot of respect for him. I'm not ripping Rudy personally on this at all, and I don't think – I know he's stubborn, but I think he's more stubborn on defense. He has learned. He's done that kind of clunky turnaround, kick it back out to the guy above the break really well. And like he's he, he's done the um, – I, I think he – he understands, um, you know, your your great hopes for a floater remain uh, push shot, push shot, <laughs> remain dubious, but hey. and, and in his hands remain dubious. I mean, there are things that, and again, if Rudy Gobert commits a turnover, you know, doing the funky dance with the ball uh, once or twice a game, he'll make that back at the other end. You know, I'm not. But the greater point is the other talent around the floor, the two timelines of the Wolves that Tim Conley has so adroitly put together, and I admire it. I mean, you're winning now, and you have a really good chance to win in the future. There's no huge drop-off five years from now. There may be some adjustments, some large adjustments, but there is no huge drop-off, and that's a credit to Conley. But the problem with that is that you still have two groups of skill sets and how you want to run your offense. And the fusion of that, when I do my season preview piece, that will be the top thing on my list. How do the Wolves manage to be more than the sum of their parts on offense when their parts seem bifurcated? I I think part of the answer, and a little bit uh, transparently, this is a segue into wanting to talk about McDaniel's and DiVincenzo as playmakers. But I think this is true: um, is you you get to that greater than the sum of your parts by having other players be greater connective tissue uh, than maybe we previously thought mm-hmm. they were or could be. And in the preseason. I think both Jaden McDaniels and Dante DiVincenzo, to me, are looking like substantially better playmaking options, more dynamic weapons off the bounce as scorers and passers within the flow of the offense uh, than I anticipated. You you referenced Jaden last night and and his uh, his playmaking and diming to to Rudy that he had. He also got Julius Randle going on that for his bucket, like. Right. Jaden Jaden is so into that little slow step Euro thing where he like almost stops. And then all of a sudden there's two guys there and his gangly arms kind of like reach around uh, to find Rudy or Randall there. Like there's going to, we're not, I'm not saying Jaden's going to be some great playmaker in this. And I'm still no. a little bit dubious of the idea that he's going to be able to run pick and roll with any volume, but I do feel pretty good about Jaden's ability to read the floor and pass or or create a shot if it's not there when he within the flow of the offense is getting downhill and and attacking the basket that was super encouraging to see last night and then the Divincenzo stuff is just blowing me away yeah I mean like, he had a rough night last night but no he didn't right. I disagree with that this okay. is the same <laughs> he didn't make his threes yeah what about he, the, the bottle dude oh, no. I don't know. I, I got I, somebody said that to me last night, too. I, and I don't know. This is where I got in trouble with the whole Dillingham thing is I don't really care about the box score in the preseason. I'm like intentionally. Right, right. I don't even have that tab open on my like computer because I'm just trying to watch. I was so impressed last night by DiVincenzo's 
ability and force and speed when going downhill out of a traditional pick and roll mm -hmm. when it's set yep. up there. Like that is stuff I did not think about. I mean, how many times have we brought up the backup point guard conversation? Like that's over to me in my mind. Like that's the guy. That's it. All whatever minutes Mike isn't going to play. Dante should be, you know, Dante can fill up as many of those as you need. I'm not saying don't play Dillingham, but if right. you deem you can't, cool. I don't see a problem. And, and if Nikhil's going to struggle with his turnovers, okay. Spot up in the corner, Dante can handle the point. Along with you have the option of Ant initiating too, which I know there's like always a little reticent to do, but I don't know. The DiVincenzo, we're all blown away by the shooting, but if we looked at the numbers as we did and watched them a little bit in New York last year, you're like, okay, yeah, this dude's getting up the threes and he's just going to take them if you give him space. The handle, the downhill action at six foot four is that is it's putting them at a different level in, in my mind. Than I, I agree with everything you said. I, I think that he did not have, he had his worst preseason game, which didn't mean it was terrible, but, uh, he his he does a lot of early shooting and early shooting when you're cold stands out that's all you know and and if you're a quote unquote point guard even a backup point guard um understand that you're not hot that night i just think that uh, I, I i think miss threes are um are so common in the NBA nowadays that people don't realize um, for every two missed threes you try, it's almost the equivalent of one turnover. You know, I mean, missed shots are not that different than turnovers in that the ball changes hands. And if you foolishly are shooting, if your shot selection is foolish, then it is the equivalent of having not as good a handle. And so this is the wrong guy to talk about in this context right now because no, but I, 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 I get what you're saying, and it's a good point. That, that's, that, he's been that's fabulous so far this year, and, and so I don't want to say, you know, oh, he shouldn't be shooting. Well, I mean uh, – But the one for 11 nights when they happen this season are going to be a little bit tough, and you're going to be like, all right, Dante, I'm not sure you needed to – Let's make it one for five, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Especially if you're as good on the pick and roll and you have your head up and you – no guys, I mean, the, the other thing to kind of pile on to your praise there, and I did in, in the column I just wrote, I mean, I love the guy, and I think his teammates love the guy. His teammates, I mean, Conley says he wants to play with him. That's immediately, anybody Mike Conley wants to play with means that dude knows how to play ball. Mm -hmm. And then you can tell Nas loves to play with him. You can tell that Ant loves to play with him. I mean, these are... uh Conley loves to play with him because he gets into a lot of secondary action that frees him up in the half court. Nas and Ant, Nas loves to play with him because he moves and makes really quick decisions. Ant loves to play with him because he spaces the floor, can hit threes and drive and kick and give it to Ant on cuts himself. Um, when a guy knows how to ball, you basically have a situation where everybody else wants to play with him. And so it's going to be interesting. He is the sixth man and who gets, you know, who remains in his rotation and who comes out and doesn't get to play with him. I mean, Conley, obviously, but it's going to be interesting. And maybe Conley won't be the first sub out, although I believe he probably will. I, I think why I, in, in what I was saying there, why I'm not, as worried about the the three point volume and the things that you highlighted there, it's I'm just a pretty big believer that he's going to be a high thirties, forty percent three point shooter. I agree. Aggregate on on high volume yeah. and yeah, we're not really disagreeing. I understood what you were saying. You you didn't like the fact I said he didn't have a good game, and I probably should have said by the standards that I've come to expect. Yeah, <laughs> perfection <laughs> by the standards of Steph Curry. Not to even judge those struggles. Um, is there a case for Dante DiVincenzo to start? Um, again, politics, man. I mean, we're already dealing with the Randall Nas dynamic. And if you start to throw the Jade McDaniels, Dante DiVincenzo dynamic in there, or 
who else is it? I mean, you know. I no, I, <laughs> it's Mike, man. Oh no, no, no! I know. I, 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 I'm for the record and listeners. Yeah. I'm not making the yeah. case that right. anybody that is in the starting lineup, I feel strongly, should be coming off the right. bench. It's just Dante Divincenzo. In the two weeks we've known him, has proven right. to be, I think, significantly more than we anticipated. And frankly, even though the Wolves front office and Finch were very high on him and trading for him, I think he's even shown to be maybe Absolutely. more more than they anticipated. And to the point where, I, I don't know, I'm I, I'm pretty sure Tante Dimitrenzo is one of the five best players on this team. Mm-hmm. And no, that, I get that. that. That is not the equivalent of, of, of needing to start. I'm just wondering if there is a case to start him and and the only way I can get to it is would be Conley coming off the bench. And the only way I can get to it is McDaniel's coming off the bench because I don't think you can you can have if you were going to play with Ant Randall and um Rudy on the court, you need Mike Conley. I mean as good as DiVincenzo has been as a playmaker Conley is the one who knows how to set Rudy and Randall up better than anybody on the team. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And so, and, and not for nothing, Mike Conley shot the ball more accurately than Dante DiVincenzo last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I on on a little less volume. Um, well, I, right. I, I agree. I don't. I don't think Which is a good thing. A, a clean way <laughs> to do this. Um, and and like you said, there's there's politic reasons surrounding every option you, you kind of go to the least being though would be Mike. If you yeah. could, if Fitch could get Mike to buy into it and be like, Hey, you're still going to play your, your 28 minutes. Also. I mean, I'm thinking about it from a rotation standpoint, right? right? Like who do they want Mike to be with as much as possible? Rudy. Right? right. And, and what was the rotation last year? First two guys to sub out of the game in the first quarter or in the third quarter to get the rotations started was Mike and Rudy would come out, so they would come back in together at the start of the second quarter, the start of the fourth quarter. Well, I mean, you could kind of get like to that if you started DiVincenzo in in Mike's place, and then and then once you had Rudy come back into the game for his second shift of that quarter or half, uh, it it could be with Mike. I think that is the one that would be the cleanest from a rotation right. standpoint. But I get it. I'm not. I'm not. Making no, no, the no, case no. And, and, I, and I'm not. I'm not taking you that seriously. I think it's yeah, a provocative you. question. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is I've been covering the NBA for you know however long, thirty-five years or something, and it is a thing for whatever reason. Starting or not starting, just matters to some people. And yeah. if you if you run across a guy who says it doesn't matter, and maybe it does. Then you start to get, you know, you get, you start to peel away some of that well, cohesion, you know, that uh, I just wouldn't risk it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I've made the same case with starting Randall over Nas for the, the same reasons. Exactly. Although but, that is a much more defensible one, in my opinion, because Randall can get a bucket. I would like Randall and Ant to be off the floor, uh, not on the floor at the same time as much as possible. That would be my theme. It's just crazy. Nas Reed won six man last year, and I don't think he's going to be the best player coming off the bench for the Wolves this year. Well, I mean, that, again, I wouldn't necessarily go that far. I was going to say when you say one of the five best players on the team, there's a lot of 4A, 4B, 4C, 4Ds there. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if you say that it's Ant, Rudy, you know, even then, uh, I would say Mike third, but Jaden fourth, maybe Dante fourth, maybe Nas fourth, you know, mm-hmm. maybe Randall fourth. I mean, again, it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, and that's what good depth is all about. We don't, the, 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 the Timberwolves not only have depth, they have the kind of depth where um, you can tweak your style and still be a viable competitor Mm-hmm. If one of your main guys goes out, Rudy being the possible exception. Okay, so let's assume the starting lineup is the starting lineup. You know, Rudy, Randall, McDaniel's, Edwards, Conley. Yep. Um, we move down to the bench. Uh, DiVincenzo and Reed 
six, seven, some order. Nikhil Alexander Walker, eight, who we can yep. talk about a little bit, struggling some, but man, I just was like, no, you can't. Some of his I mean, numbers, I know, yeah. He is so valuable in all the ways that, you know, uh, people who really watch the games, uh, I mean, scouts, I would imagine. All I know is that I see him do all kinds of little things. Being able to harass somebody to the point where you're kind of in their head when they're dribbling out on the perimeter, that that's a really big thing in the modern NBA. And and I still think it's like slept on how good of a volume three point shooter he was last season, mm-hmm. right? I mean, Especially from the corner, which is the, for some reason this team doesn't they, they kind of ignore the corner threes. But with Nah, it's really hard to ignore it. Mm-hmm. Which hopefully Randall's more willing to be there. Than yeah. Brad. I thought Jim Pete had a good uh, point on the broadcast that Randall shot poorly from three last year, but but uh, but well, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a little bit of. Uh, 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 polishing there. Sure. Um, I mean, it, it, it is, but it's Julius like Randall is a career 33.3% shooter after 10 years in the NBA. Let's not say he had a bad year last year. Let's no, 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 say, no. Let's I don't say, think. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I mean, Julius Randall is traditionally not a good three point shooter. He has had outlier years where he's been in the high thirties yep. and that's been great. But uh, let's, if you bank on that, um, you know, you're well, okay. So that's exactly what I'm saying. If you're a 33% three point shooter for your career, you should not corner, right. get, you should not get <laughs> free range to shoot whatever three point shot right. you want to shoot. You, right. Your coach should be telling you to prioritize corner threes, which are the right. easier threes, which he historically has made at a higher clip that he's made a, the above the break ones. I don't have oh, those good. numbers. That, okay. I don't have those numbers in front of me exactly, but that, whatever, like any player on any team, that's what I would say is like, Hey, yeah. you're not making enough of them. Let's let go of some of the, you know, the, the, the top of the key three. And also, there. I mean, I can, if, if, if a little or big is closing out on him on a weak side swing pass, a skip pass. Uh, I like Randall's chances of either getting by that guy or bullying him down low. Uh, he seems like a really good option I mean, put it this way, the kind of ISO I would not mind is if the floor tilts because Randall has the ball and he's not really guarded well right now. Mm-hmm. Then I don't mind like he did with Kobe White the other night. Yep. I mean, that who's the guy who happened to be on him because the, the defense had to shift <laughs> over. All right, then by all means, go to work. Yeah. That first dunk he had, right? Yeah. Like, where he's driving on the right side, dunked it with his left hand. Yeah. All day. Like shifted. It's the same. I don't want to say it's the same thing as Ant, but it's the same idea as Ant. You get Ant on the second side when the defense has already shifted. That right. defense is in trouble if Ant directly goes to the basket. And the same is true uh, with Randall. But I want to keep going through the, the rotation part. Sure. So six, seven, eight, uh, Reed, DiVincenzo, Alexander Walker, because we think Alexander Walker still deserves that. I mean, 260. I've been he does. catch and shoot threes. Like crazy on these episodes, so maybe some people are rolling their eyes. I was looking at this: two hundred sixty-four catch and shoot threes last season that he made at forty-one point seven percent. I looked up like who, like how many other players did that. He's one of eighteen guys to do that, which maybe doesn't sound that crazy. But if you look at the other seventeen names, they are the guys. They are the shooter. They right. are like they are stars, or they're like Malik Beasley, Sam Hauser, right. uh, Michael Porter Jr., like shooter shooters. Nikhil. Last season, when his confidence was fully That's there, the key, right? Yeah, that is, that is and the that, key. That, no, but that mm-hmm. that kind of reinforces your point. If you make him the ninth or tenth man uh-huh. rather than the seventh or eighth man, uh-huh. then you begin to see that three point percentage drop, in my mm-hmm. opinion, because he is such a confidence player. And so, you've seen it. You've seen it in the preseason already. Mm-hmm. So nine, nine in the rotation. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you got? Uh, I know what Finch will have. He'll have Ingles. Okay. Over Dillingham? Um, depends on DiVincenzo. I think I think it'll I think that will vary game to game. But I do think that Ingles will be in the top ten. Let's put it that way. Whether it's Dingles or <laughs> Dingles. <laughs> Dillingham or Ingles. Uh yes. it will be those guys will get about the same amount of minutes, in my opinion. But depending on how they're individually playing, those minutes 
will fluctuate from game to game. And plus the fact that what Finch said to me was uh, one of the ways you have resting old guys and Ingles will get rest. Sure. I, I guess I'm just thinking about it from LA on Tuesday um, opening night or those, those first couple yeah. of games. Um, it, I think again, it'll be a, it'll be a cerebral decision. It'll be a choice mm-hmm. by Finch. Do I want to have my wily vet who I need as a, you know, stabilizer kind of guy um, out there and, I understand why the question is even being posed because Ingles does not look good. And, and I believe I'm hoping anyway, that he is enough of a veteran to kind of take this preseason to go at his own pace. He hasn't been looking for his shot, which is one of the more important aspects of his game. He's been really a ball mover almost to a fault when he's been out there on the other hand, defensively, he's he's making quasi take fouls at an alarming rate, which indicates to me that he just doesn't have the foot speed to stay with people anymore. Um, he doesn't. It, never has. I'm not it, as concerned. His thirty first thirty days are going to be a sure. referendum uh, on what happens with him, and so, obviously, but Dillingham Dilling the same way. Yeah. Crazy, you know? So, so that's what that's the thing is. It's like, okay, well, if Finch is going to play ten guys, then it doesn't really matter between Ingles and Dillingham who's nine, right? Because right. then there's that's nine true. and ten. That is the but truth. Dude, Josh, <laughs> where Josh Bidon's got to play, right? Like, no, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, you've seen what Finch does. I'm They're playing Josh play. Minot over Joe Ingles and Rob Dillingham in the first game. I'm okay. There. Okay. I'm well, there. Um, I'm there. Well, I, I, there is obviously there's huge questions about Ingles that you just ran through. And I say that, that I'm need there. to be answered as soon as possible. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I'm not, I personally don't think those need to be figured out in the game. I think they, I think, I think that's the only way you figure them out. I think I, Joe Ingles is going to yeah, play. Yeah, but I think I think you are significantly more concerned about how slow and take foully Joe Ingles looks like than they are because they knew that's exactly what they were getting. That's what Joe Ingles looked like playing defense before he tore his ACL three years ago. You know, mm-hmm. like, I mean, mm-hmm. you can not want Joe Ingles to play. I'm saying I think he's worse on defense than I remember him being in the past. And he was never very good, but Finch's defense – when I talked to him that time was he knows the system. He's a good communicator. He tells people where they should be, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and that is good for a second unit. He's also a vet that can kind of anchor. He can be like a Conley type calmer in the second unit. Mm -hmm. Um, And he also can be somebody who is, um, a, you know, a guy who initiates the go-go of Nas and Ant and Dil- and Dante DiVincenzo uh, without having, you know, being the trailing three eventually, you know. But uh, I do think that they're, they need to find out whether Joe Ingles can give them what they hoped they were going to get from him. Um, and then I think if you give the keys to Minot, and then you you begin to mess with it. I just don't. I, it doesn't make as much sense to me. It's for the same reason you're playing Randall over Nas. The same reason you know you're playing Conley over whoever. Uh, you need to to go into the season. All right, this is who we have. This is what we're going to do. Josh Minot is already feeling good about himself. If he doesn't get immediate minutes. I don't think it's going to quash his spirit. It may wreck a little of his momentum, but I also think that the Lakers are an interesting team in that regard. Uh, you know, I mean, they're big and, and, and they punish. I'm thinking about it from a Dillingham standpoint. Like I, I want Dillingham to play this year. And I think, I think he should, I do think it's a little bit instructive that he what didn't play with the rotation guys last night. Right. Um, and there seemed to be something intentional about that. I think they wanted to give DiVincenzo a lot of on-ball reps, point guard yep. sort yep. of stuff. That seemed to be some of the motivation behind that. Um, 
but but as it got to be like halftime and I'm like, OK, like Dillingham hasn't played. I did have that like, you know, conversation with myself in my head of like, well, maybe he just doesn't isn't in the rotation right away at the beginning of the season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first time Mike or another guard gets hurt a couple of weeks into the season or needs some time off, then he's like slowly integrated into the rotation um, on, on a little bit more of a need basis, mm -hmm. hopefully as he's kind of acclimated a, a, a little bit more to, to the process. I, I don't think, I don't think Dillingham has like done anything for me in the preseason to have like lost the, the spot that I had assigned no. to him or that they had assigned to him. It's just, I, as, as we're better getting to understand what DiVincenzo can be as as a handler, I see a little bit less of a need for a handler, a point guard mm -hmm. in, in Dillingham out there. And, and then I'm just noting what, what Josh Minot did. And it just wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if the bench on opening night, nobody's told me this or anything. This is just right. Uh, is Reed, DiVincenzo, Alexander Walker, Ingles, and Minot. Uh -huh. and, and I think that kind of makes sense for the Lakers matchup to your point too, because the one area we are most concerned about Rob is downhill in the paint, particularly at the rim, needing to finish or navigate big bodies. And the Lakers and vice versa at the other end of the court, you know, being sure. you know being bullied by Austin Reeves or somebody, you know. Sure. Um, I don't know. It, last time was the first time I was like, oh, maybe Dillingham won't play on on opening night, or the idea crossed my mind. The thing about Minot, again, he strikes me as a go-go guy. He strikes me as a flow player. So, again, how much do you want to lean into that with your second unit? Um, because Ingles is not necessarily – he's 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 a great passer, and he's a good half-court player, um, and he's a good spot-up shooter. It's a – you know – I think tonight we'll we'll give us some more clues, obviously, mm -hmm. and I also think that um, if you put a gun to Finch's head, I don't think he would know now. I don't think he really knows what eight, nine, and ten will be yet. Even you don't even think he does for opening night, right? I think he's thinking yeah. seriously about it. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, that's fair. I think you I know, think and and after that, it's Sacramento, right? Very different team, and then Toronto at home. You know, that's kind of a Toronto. I mean, they're an interesting <laughs> team, you know. And so it's like, um, it's just, it's got to be a TBD deal. You know, I mean, we can speculate, but your guess is as good as mine, literally. Yeah, yeah no, fair, fair, fair. <laughs> I'm just saying, my guess, my guess has shockingly evolved a lot in preseason when I try to not be too influenced by preseason in general. But, mm. but at the same time, like, if there was ever a preseason to be like a little bit moved by what happened, it would be after a, a big trade that you didn't have your head really wrapped around before the preseason started. Uh, the emergence of a 22 year old and uh, some of the, you know, growing process of a 19 year old that doesn't mm -hmm. seem uh, right. really there or age of a 37 year old. I, I think, um, I think it's totally normal for us or for anybody else to be like, have adjusted the little rotation that we drew up ourselves right. three weeks ago and been like, Oh yeah, I have a different answer to that and question. Now. I think Chris Finch had the perfect take on Minot. Uh, and maybe he said this after the game. I don't know. I hadn't read it before, but then again, I haven't, you know, necessarily caught up with everything he said, but he said that he's always been somebody that has been around when good and bad things happen. <laughs> it's just that there is fewer bad things now. And that is absolutely right. Minot is somebody who is engaged in the action. He's always had that knack. Some guys are just, they disappear and that's a good quality too. You know, they're just, oh. they, they subsume themselves in the team. Mm -hmm. And Minot just has this kind of like, gangly raw athleticism that is becoming more mature as his decision making and his shot accuracy both grow and as a result some of the gambles he used to take that kind of broke the discipline of the defense 
he's balancing that more. He's still kind of gambling, but he's also staying at home. But he's finding himself partly because he moves well without the ball, partly because, quite frankly, he's not a name. He's not on the scouting report yet, probably, by anybody. But he is finding ways to be impactful. A diversity as, of ways. As he always has been impactful. It's just that now they're better considered. They're better executed. And um, that is an argument to say, well, how how – He's on an upward trajectory. You know, do we let this guy go? I just think that it's my experience that um, you don't usually reward. I'm trying to think of somebody who got rewarded that way. Um, Jalen Noel. <laughs> yeah, I guess. You're right. You're right. I mean, in its own way, um, Jalen Noel was given a leash. We'll give you that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you that. Um and, and you're right. No, no, that's that's an accurate answer. I happen to think that um, that was a team that had a lot more question marks. Yeah, uh, no, no, fair, fair. But can can I just uh, and I know people who are listening in podcast version hate when I put clips up on the screen because they can't see them. But I, I YouTube, I, I just want to play like hit I'll eleven, uh, hit eleven. <laughs> yeah, okay, Brits, 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 Brits gonna narrate here. We are over an hour into the episode, so I'm I'm, I'm fine with that. But. Mine had 11 points in the last two minutes and like 24 seconds. It was tremendous. Hey, I'm, I, I have the, the second office. turnaround three, man. <laughs> Nuts. I'm, I'm just gonna. We're just gonna. We're just gonna right. play them right here. There's right. this. I mean, this one is just a pick and roll. Yep. It's down it. There he goes, Gangly, and way over. And that's when he landed right on his ass and wondered why he didn't get fouled. And he eventually know. he did get fouled and hit the free throw. So there's three there. I like this one. This is a DiVincenzo Garza pick and roll on the opposite yeah. side. And and Minot, look, watch Minot here. This is smart. Like he finds yeah. it. He just kind of snugs in uh, in the on the opposite block and DiVincenzo finds him, right? I think that's what this one is. Yeah. Like like that. Right. That is that is. And, a he, and he slightly had to alter his shot. You know, I, it wasn't. If he had gone up straight and clean, he would have been blocked. Athlete 6'9". I mean, right. right. You right. can watch. He's like 6'9", right? Nine, right? I mean, he's this, he's the, and he's definitely, he's, he's definitely put on I mean, you know, I love rookie year. I just thought his attitude sucked last year. Yeah. He really thought he deserved more minutes. Like and now he's right saying, you know, watch he him get, watch him get out on, on the break here. Oh, uh, yeah. This is great. I mean, it looks funny, but I mean, no. Well, he always looks funny when he runs. Jab, bang. Yep. I mean, and he does that, that little hop that all players do when they're on. Yeah. And this is, a, this is the one I love. This one's nuts. End of the quarter, 3.77. Yeah. What the hell is yeah, that? Oh, turn around. Almost, steps on, almost turns around and, oh, and steps God. out of bounds. I was actually yeah, shocked. It wasn't out of bounds on that, that one. Was, that was crazy. I they just, they just run it again here. So <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like He's a lot of fun. And a, a, nothing would please me more than to uh, throw him into the mix. Because, again, I think that's a fly-around guy, man. I think that uh, – He'll make, you know, he's another one of those guys like Dillingham, like Joe Ingles. The thing about all three of those guys is they could all be great or they all could really be bad yeah. from game to game, you know? I, I don't know, man. Color me intrigued. I, I remember at Summer League, somebody from the Wolves said to me, like, oh, I think Minot's going to play this year. And I actually, like, openly laughed, like, thinking that I, I thought they were, like, uh -huh. they were joking. And, and um, he didn't even look that good in summer league. They didn't. played go go, which is his style. And he uh, did it was, again, yeah. once again, he was a little bit too thirsty. And, I don't and, know, man. He this dude's he's been real. He's been he's had a great thirsty. month. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Maybe it'll go down as a as a preseason thing and whatever. Maybe. And, but uh, you know, they drafted him for a reason. I loved them right away. I mean, you you remember? I mean, Kyle yeah. and I were probably the original. Uh, Guys and the, the 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 driver and the shotgun of the uh, Minot bandwagon his rookie season because he was yeah. always in he was always doing things that were fun to watch and most of the time they were good kind of fun you know right. it's kind of like Corey Brewer you know totally you know weird. one of those things where sometimes it's it's weird and not mm. good it's a little too gangly a little bit yeah. too much uh, you're out over your skis but other times 
you're just, you know, you're running around with that that springy body and you're you're getting in the way in all the right, right ways. Um, you know, I, I would love to see him step forward. You know, he'll, again, it'll be a yet another player that you you enjoy watching. This team has got a bunch of them. It's, I, yeah. I mean, and, and I don't know, maybe some of it, I haven't been super locked in on what his defense is or isn't. I think that's always kind of a little bit tough to tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's harder to tell in preseason, at least. than. Uh, but he gets in the way. He's not afraid to help yeah. aggressively. And that is that that is something that um, a lot of times players are, uh, in my, this is just my opinion, everybody can be on either side of this fence, but most players are too reluctant to leave their man and mm-hmm. therefore allow something that they might have interfered with um, to go past them. He's mm-hmm. not one of those guys usually. He's, he's like Ant in that he's big and eth- athletic enough that when he's in the wrong spot, he can get back to the right spot before it becomes a problem. And when he decides to commit on help, he can be a problem or a follower, mm-hmm. but I like the impulse. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be interesting. I think he, I would assume he will play uh, again tonight in, in yeah. this Nuggets Yeah, and that'd matchup. be fun. You know, yeah. Um, Aaron Gordon. <laughs> Why not versus Aaron Gordon? No, I mean, mostly yeah. Porter Jr. I think he's, he's still the three, which I think, you know, small ball. He could be a small ball four. I still love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's 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 going to be interesting to see what the night one rotation is, and I'm sure yeah. And who we'll Denver plays around. tonight? Who the Wolves play tonight? It's all you know. Yeah, I'm uncertain. Not, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not looking for that many informative nuggets in uh, this <laughs> Nuggets matchup uh, tonight. But uh, but I, it's going to be fun to get back at Target Center. Um, I will see you there, Britt. Uh, in a few hours. Appreciate you doing this. Sure. Um, those of you uh, who are listening. Um, if you want to go read Brits, I mean, Brits going to have a season preview uh, column that came that comes out, but he had uh, a piece that came out. I think it was on Monday, maybe Tuesday, Tuesday um, yeah. on the on the some some preseason uh, takeaways that uh, not. I mean, we haven't even talked about all of them uh, in here on on today's episode. So I'd rem- I'd recommend checking that out uh, at uh, inpost.com. Uh, Kyle and I will be back tomorrow. Britt and I will be at Falling Knife on saturday afternoon until yeah until friday morning with kyle he's brit i'm dane peace out i won't feel it man i hope it never stop yeah green it hot so you can find me in the crowd yeah yeah don't let standards ever ever bring you down yeah